نستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فاخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل فانقلبوا من نعمة من الله وفضل لم يمسسهم سوء واتبعوا رضوان الله والله ذو فضل عظيم رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين Today's khutbah is very difficult as you know about the news that has recently arrived from California, the horrible tragedy that nobody can make sense of, how a young couple with a baby can do allegedly what they've done, and how Muslims are supposed to respond, how the entire nation is supposed to respond. Actually, everybody you talk to is confused about the subject. And there are people who would take an opportunity like this one to spread fear, and they have. I mean, just not so long ago, we had to deal with what was going on in Paris, it was across the shores, and we are wrapped up in this situation over and over again. And I actually, in this last week, I, the, the, before I left for my international travel, the halaqa I usually do in tafsir, I canceled it to try to even help the Irving community, just kind of think about how we're supposed to respond from the Qur'an. So what I'm going to try to do in this week, inshallah, is two things. Briefly, I want to share with you not just how Muslims should respond, but Muslims should understand how the Qur'an itself responds, how Allah's book responds to something like this. This is number one of benefit for yourself. And number two, you should be learning the book of Allah so you can share the book of Allah. You know, out of this, this, this shar that's, that we're surrounded with, this horrible tragedy that we're surrounded with, there's, there's an actually opportunity for you because people are going to come and ask you. Your non-Muslim friends are going to come and ask you. You know, your, co your, your friends in college will ask you, your co-workers will ask you. And at that point, you don't want to just stand there baffled or say something that you don't know about. Maybe it's an opportunity to share something from Allah's book itself. So hopefully you take into account some things I'm going to share with you today, inshallah, and maybe use it for yourself. And the, uh, the, the first reminder, I try to take it less than five minutes because it's not the actual subject of my khutbah, just as a reminder to you and myself. Allah's book is very serious and, you know, absolute in its declaration that innocent people, civilians of any kind, can never be harmed. It is impossible for a Muslim to engage in such an act and think that it has anything to do with jihad. It is absolutely utterly impossible. As a matter of fact, killing another human being is tantamount to killing, all, killing of all of humanity, which is the greatest crime there can be, as far as a crime against another human being is concerned. But the way to understand that properly, and th so that you're so clear that Qur'an condemns this kind of thing. You know, Muslims condemn it, that's one thing. I want to help you understand how the Qur'an condemns it, how the Book of Allah condemns it. Allah describes in the Madani Qur'an, when the Prophet moved to Medina, everybody here knows the enemy was Makkah. The enemy were the people of Quraysh. And the Muslims went to war with those people multiple times. In the course of just a few years, we had gone to battle with the Quraysh, 
you know, not just in Badr, not just in Uhud, and even Ahzab, and then there are some other skirmishes in between. So we're constantly at war with the people of Mecca. They are the enemy, and obviously those of them that are mushrik, that still worship idols, there's no confusion. These are the kuffar. These are the people we have to fight. These are the enemy. But then comes a situation when the Prophet ﷺ goes to Hudaybiyah because he sees a dream that he's going to make Hajj. So he goes into the lion's den. He goes right to the mouth of the enemy, right there. And they start negotiating. And when they negotiate, I'm summarizing very quickly because I have to wrap this up within five minutes. One of our ambassadors, Uthman anhu, went inside Mecca to negotiate. And then he didn't come back. He disappeared. Nobody's heard from him. And a whole day almost goes by and the Muslims are starting to wonder, did they kill our ambassador? Did they kill him? And they love Uthman radiallahu anhu. So now if the, the wild rumor spreads in the Muslim camp that Uthman has gone inside Mecca and they've killed him. Keep in mind, we've already gone with, to war with these people three times. Also keep in mind that there has been two-thirds of the Qur'an was revealed to those people. Also keep in mind that these are the people who insulted the Prophet, humiliated the Prophet. They're the ones who kicked the Prophet out of his home and half the Muslims that are there. They, these are the people that have done all kinds of wrong to Muslims. And now, after all of that, the rumor has come, they've even killed Uthman. Now the Muslims are thirsty for blood, they're about to go in. And they know, they came for Hajj, they didn't come armed, but they didn't care. They took a bay'ah with the Prophet ﷺ for, for avenging the death of Uthman, they took a pledge, we're gonna avenge the death of Uthman, we're gonna go in anyway, even if we all get killed, we don't care. They were ready to do it. And that bravery, Allah commended in the Qur'an. But in the same surah that Allah commended and commented on that bravery, if you bayi'unaka tahta shajara, when they took a pledge with you under the tree, in that same surah later on, Allah describes that they didn't actually go because Uthman came back. He was safe. He wasn't killed. So there was no need for bloodshed. But when Allah describes that there was no need for bloodshed, He gives reasons why was there no bloodshed. Why was there no bloodshed? And here's the reason Allah gives. This is what I want you to remember at the end of Surah Al-Fatih. He says, وَلَوْلَا رِجَالٌ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَنِسَاءٌ مُؤْمِنَاتٌ لَمْ تَعْلَمُوهُمْ أَن تَطَعُوهُمْ فَتُصِيبَكُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَعَرَّةٌ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ لِيُدْخِلَ اللَّهُ فِي رَحْمَتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ لَوْ تَزَيَّنُوا لَعَذَّبْنَا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا It is because there are believing men and believing women that you have never known. Inside Mecca, there are believing men and believing women who have Iman in their hearts. You have no idea who they are. There's no way for you to know who has Iman inside them. Keep in mind, this is Mecca. Every time the Muslims thought about Mecca, they thought about the people that they fought wars with, the enemy. And Allah says, actually, no, even the one you think is the enemy, right now inside that city, there are people who have Iman and you have no idea. You have no clue. They, you don't even know if they took shahada or if they took shahada in front of someone or they're hiding that iman in their heart. You have not known them at all. And if you did attack them, you would actually trample and walk all over them. You would destroy them. You would kill them. You'd end up killing believers or people who have belief in their heart. Can you see if somebody has iman in their heart? You don't. Can you see if somebody's on their journey to iman, to Allah? You don't. Great mut ugliness, mutilation would be slapped on top of you as an ummah and you wouldn't even know. You would become the ugliest nation. Nobody would ever want to come close to you because you killed someone who, who could even have had faith. And this is people we directly went to war with. This is people, Mecca, the kuffar. Quran is so harsh against most of the time when Quran uses the word kuffar and you know the enemies, adu, it's talking about the Quraysh. And even then, when it came to just going into a city and killing, he said, no, 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 you can't do that. That's for the battlefield. That's not for a city. You can't do that. There may be people that have iman inside. And you have no idea. And then Allah adds, لِيُدْخِلَ اللَّهُ فِي رَحْمَتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاء So Allah may enter into His mercy whoever Allah wants, or whoever He wants. Who are you to decide who gets punished and doesn't get punished? What authority do you think you are? You, the anger of the Muslim might say, these people don't deserve any mercy. And Allah says, who, do you, who, who are you to decide that? Who made you in charge? I decide who gets my mercy and who doesn't. And by the way, they didn't fight. And by the way, after not fighting, not so much later, Abu Sufyan, who was one of the leaders of the enemy, became Muslim. So if they fought him, he would have been killed. So Allah says, he'll enter into his mercy whoever he wants. 
لو تزيلوا لعذبنا الذين كفروا منهم عذابا أليما had they been completely separated the people of Iman and the people of Kufr had they been one neighborhood of people who believe and another neighborhood and nobody in their heart has any Iman had that ever been possible then Allah would have punished the disbelieving nation himself لعذبنا الذين كفروا he wouldn't need you to come and attack Allah is describing in this ayah that believers and non-believers, people who have iman in their heart, and people who don't have iman in their heart, they're always going to be mixed in with each other in a society. They can never be separated. You're not going to go into an, a, you know, a, a school or a store or an office and all the people there have iman. Or a neighborhood, everybody has iman. And another neighborhood, nobody has iman. So Allah can destroy that part. It's never going to happen. That's not going to happen. Even when Allah used to destroy nations in the past, فَمَا وَجَدْنَا فِيهَا غَيْرَ بَيْتٍ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ You know, فَأَخْرَجْنَا مَنْ كَانَ فِيهَا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ We took out everybody who had iman first, then destroyed the nation. The fact that nations are still around, you know what that means? There are people of iman still around, and they're mixed in. You can't attack anybody. You can't attack anybody. Subhanallah. This is, this is just for us. This is not for, any, for PR or what we tell non-Muslims. First of all, we need to understand how we think. We all know it's wrong. We all know it's wrong. But I want you to understand from the Qur'an's perspective, even when you think of someone as an enemy, it's not that simple. The Qur'an wants you to think deeply. But the t today's khutbah is actually more, and more importantly, about ourselves, and about how we're going to continually be put in a situation of this nerve-wrecking experience. When, you know, because now I'm, I'm a parent, many of you are parents, we have, we have children, you know, and this looks like they weren't, these people weren't on any radar. What does that mean for us? You know, we don't, we don't think like everybody else does. Because we're like, oh God. Next time we go to the airport. Next time we're at the mall. They're going to say, oh, they look innocent just like those, those guys. They weren't on any list either. They're just a husband, Muslim husband and wife going to shopping at the mall. God knows what they've got in that bag. You know? And now our families are, are scared. Our children are scared. We're scared for them. We're nerve-wrecked. You know, you can't go to so much as a Walmart or some, some store or whatever and walk in and not think, oh, who's going to do something? You have to look twice when you go in a parking lot. Who might think, and what happened to that poor cab driver in New York? I'm, I'm, I don't know how many other countless incidents. It is a terrifying situation for ourselves and our families. You know, and this masjid knows that all too well. <laughs> you know, how terrifying the situation is. But in the midst of all of that terror and all of that fear that we're experiencing, and there are people who would love to make money off of this fear. That's why they do this. They don't do this because they hate us. They do this because they love money. You have to remember that. Their hatred for us is very little. Their love for money is very big. Okay, they make a lot of money off of the Islamophobia industry. It's just capitalism. That's all it is to them. This is why it will not stop. No matter how much you try to explain that Muslims are peaceful, no matter how much you try to explain that this is wrong, there are some people who will continue to put this out because this is their career. This is how they sell their books. This is how they fill their halls. You know, that's what they're going to do. So that machinery will not stop. They will not stop. But I want to give you and myself a reminder of how we're supposed to think about this and where, where we're supposed to find strength. These ayat came to my mind immediately when I, when I thought about our situation. And I'll start from an unexpected place. But actually, I'll start where I, from the ayah I recited to you during the Arabic part of my khutbah. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ Allah is describing a group of people. He says about these people, people came to them and said, إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ Oh my God, no doubt about it. All the people, they've all gathered against you. Oh man, they're all scheming about you. فَخْشَوْهُمْ You should be afraid of them. You should be terrified. There are people talking about, maybe this is time to leave America. Maybe Canada is a better place now. Maybe we should, you know, or maybe I should trim my beard a little bit more. Maybe get rid of it. Maybe have a discussion in the family whether or not our women should be wearing hijab anymore. They look too Muslim, it's too obvious. Listen, you look Muslim anyway. <laughs> you can't, you know, Sikhs get beat up. Hindus get beat up because people think they're Muslim. Okay? So they, they don't really have the intelligence to know what Muslim and not Muslim. But people are thinking maybe somehow if we, just, if we just set some kind of PR thing and people might not hate us so much or maybe all this time, my whole life, I forgot about taking care of my neighbors. And the Prophet saw some hadith about 40 neighbors this way and that way and all of that. I never thought about it, but today I realize maybe I should be taking care of my neighbors. <laughs> you should be taking care of them because maybe now they'll think I'm a nice guy. Now I should do it. 
this is this now you remember, huh? <laughs> now you remember. What sincerity is that? We're thinking that protection will come from people. So people are told, people are gathering against you. Muslims are told, people are gathering against you. Fakhshawhum, be afraid of them. And when they hear this, what's their reaction? Fazadahum imanan. They are even more increased in iman. Waqalu hasbun Allah. Allah is enough for us. Wa ni'mal wakil. And what an incredible the what an incredible choice we've made to the one for who'll take care of all the things we need to get taken care of. The one who we've relied on, the one who'll dispose of everything is Allah. This is the time to turn back to Allah. Well, who gets to turn back to Allah? When we say we've relied on Allah. When you rely on someone, when I rely on someone, when I rely on a lawyer, when I rely on a, on a builder, you know, when I rely on an airlines, whatever instructions they give me, I follow. I follow it because I trust them. And I trust that what they're telling me to do is in my best interest. This is actually what it means to rely on someone. Not just to trust them, but whatever instructions they're giving you, you have complete confidence that that's better for you. So if you and I want to rely on Allah, then let's follow some instructions. Let's listen to what He has to say and do it because that's in our best interest. People who have no confidence that when Allah tells you to pray, that that's actually good for you. People who have no confidence that when, they, when He says something is haram, that's actually bad for you. You have no confidence, you do it anyway. Then when trouble comes, you want to rely on Allah. That's not reliance. So when they say we rely on Allah, that actually means they've placed their confidence in Allah. What is good for them, and when they turn to Allah, they know for a fact that when they follow His guidelines, He will protect them. He will protect them, He will give them good. They'll be taken care of, if they just establish what He says. This is the promise to previous nations too. So now they say Allah is enough for us. By the way, in the ayah before this, these people are not pessimistic, they're optimistic. Situation is very bad. These ayat have to do with what happened at Uhud. After the Muslims, you know, 60 of them were killed. They were, they were, there was a whore, the Prophet was almost killed, Sallallahu Several of them are injured. And now the news is coming that the enemy is coming back and attacking you again. And then these ayat came. We are already crushed with bad news. And now more bad news came. And then Allah describes, these are the people who said, when people are gathering against you, you should be scared. Allah is enough. That's good enough for us. And then in the next ayah, فَانْقَلَبُوا بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ This is the sunnah of Allah. When people truly rely on Allah. When they truly become comfortable that Allah will take care of them. When they hand their matter over to Him. Then they came back by the special favor of Allah. بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ Allah, And on top of that, وَفَضْلٍ On top of that, additional gifts from Allah. Not only will Allah get you out of this mess, He will give you more than you ever had even before. This mess even started. وَفَضْلٍ لَمْ يَمْسَسْهُمْ سُوء No harm ever touched them. No harm ever touched them. This is the promise of Allah to those who put their trust in Him. Harm will not touch you. And those are the people, they, they, the only thing they were after is making Allah happy. That's what they were after. They were not after making people happy. They realized the only real protection is Allah. So, so long as Allah is on their side, they'll be fine. And Allah is the one who possesses the, greatest, the great favor, or a great favor. And by the way, Fadlin Azim, the Nakira here, some ulama comment, that it's some great favor. Suggesting that the way Allah will give you favors, you can't even imagine. You don't even know how He's going to give you a favor. You can't see in your situation how this can be good. And Allah will turn something that nobody thought could be good into something good. He'll bring good out of things you cannot imagine. The one who produces life out of death can produce anything out of anything. You know, Wallahu dhu fadlin azim. And then Allah describes, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ Ayah after ayah after ayah, it's like it's our situation. He says, all of what you heard, everything that, all the propaganda you heard, all of that was just shaitan. That was just shaitan. يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ He instills fear, he puts fear into people who make friends with him. Very powerful statement. 
All it was, was shaitan putting fear into his own friends. Now this is pretty scary, because then Allah is teaching us that if you and I are in a constant state of fear, it is the same as making friends with shaitan. يُخَوِّفُ أُولِيَاءَهُ Subhanallah. If you don't, if you start losing the fear of Allah, fear is a human, natural human tendency. And if for a believer, the fear of Allah goes away, and the reliance on Allah goes away, then the empty space is filled by shaitan. And when you let shaitan into your heart, whether he's scaring you or anything else, you've befriended him. You've handed matters over to him. يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ You've handed your heart over to the enemy. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ So don't be afraid of them. Allah is saying, don't be scared of them. Don't be scared of people. Now I'm not asking you to do stupid things. Don't walk into a store and say, I'm Muslim and I'm not scared. Because Allah says, <laughs> hold on. You don't have to, you know, sister, you wear hijab, mashallah, you are doing jihad fi sabilillah every time you walk out of the house. Wallahi al-azim. The guys, you, you may not look very Muslim, actually. Well, women look Muslim all the time. All the time. Every eye on them. And now spiteful eyes. And people say things to them. How many of our sisters and mothers upstairs have heard things? In their own neighborhood. They live in this place. And they've heard terrible things. And we weren't around. You know? They, they're driving and they hear things. They go shopping and they hear things. They see the way people look at them. They face that all the time. But that doesn't mean that you have to go out there unnecessarily. You have to take precaution too. There are crazy people out there. They are looking to harm us. We don't say Allah will protect us no matter what. Now let's walk into a, you know, a gun store. You know? Or an NRA convention or something. No. Don't put yourself in harm's way. But don't be afraid that if you're not taking any, if you're, so long as you're taking precautions, your alliance is with Allah, that, you, that harm will come your way. Have some faith. Don't be overrun by fear. That's no way to live. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ don't be afraid of them, be afraid of me if in fact you truly have Iman. But then Allah describes that this state of fear that the Muslims are in, there are, there's a group of people, they seem to have an unlimited amount of resources. And they use all of their resources to instill fear and hatred towards Muslims. That's what they do. And I told you it's an industry. And it seems like they have way more money than we do. We barely have money to keep the water running for the wudu in the masjid. And they have millions and millions of dollars to do advertising campaigns and buy politicians and publish books and blast the media and they're on all the major news outlets and oh my god, they have all these crazy resources compared to us. It's like one seed compared to a forest. There's no competition as far as resources is concerned. And so Allah describes this problem of the Muslim feeling helpless because they don't have the resources. And the ones who hate the Muslims, they seem to have all the resources. So Allah describes what He's... Because Allah is the one in control. He's the one who handed them the resources. He's the one who gave us whatever we have. So then what's the... What, how, how do we understand this equation? So Allah says, in the same ilk, وَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ الَّذِينَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْكُفْرِ The people who are making all kinds of efforts to further the cause of disbelief. Don't let those people make you sad. Listen to that again. The people who are making these efforts in kufr, don't let them make you sad. Becoming depressed by those people. Look at what the news is saying. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing here. Look at what they're saying there. Look at what they're, they're, the policies they're making, etc, etc, etc. If that stuff gets you depressed, you're going exactly against what Allah told you not to do. Exactly against that. Allah told you, don't let that depress you. Your people of Iman. فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ الَّذِينَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْكُفْرِ This is what the Prophet was told وسلم, Not getting depressed and pessimistic because of the news is a sunnah. That's fulfilling a sunnah of the Prophet وسلم. He wasn't even allowed to get depressed when he was almost killed. He was told, no, 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 don't, don't, be, don't be sad by that. He passed out. His tooth was shaheed. The Sahaba thought he was killed. And when he woke up, he was upset. And then ayat, multiple ayat came commenting on what happened at Uhud. These are the ayat. And now he's being told even, you, even now, you cannot be sad. No matter what efforts they've made. No matter what successes they've had. They came this close to killing you. Even now you can't be sad. 
Keep optimistic. You're people of Alhamdulillah. You're people of optimism. You're people that always have a reason to praise Allah. Always has, have a reason to, to, to thank Allah. فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ الَّذِينَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْكُفْرِ إِنَّمَا yeah, And Allah says, إِنَّهُمْ لَنْ يَضُرُوا اللَّهَ شَيْئَا Listen, they can't harm Allah. And I never said they can harm Allah. I know they can't harm Allah. My, my concern was they can harm me. So why is Allah saying, by the way, don't worry, they can't harm Allah. Because you and everything you have is not yours. It comes from a source. And that source is Allah. They cannot touch Allah. They cannot harm Allah. Which means the source that provides you and protects you and takes care of you and plans for you is beyond their reach. The resource you have is Allah. The resource they have is money and media and power. And they have that. You have Allah. And their resources can never touch your resource. Your resource is Allah. إِنَّهُمْ لَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا They can harm Allah in any way, shape or form. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَلَّا يَجْعَلَ لَهُمْ حَظًّا فِي الْآخِرَةِ Allah just wants that they have not even a single bit left in the Akhirah. These people that have become enemies of the truth, and they want to spread hate and fear, Allah just wants them to continue to do their evil, so they dig their hole even deeper in the Akhirah. Allah doesn't want to give them even a single ounce of mercy. And Allah does not want to punish them in the Akhirah, He wants to have them dig their own hole in this dunya first. Don't you worry. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ They have painful punishment. And I'll skip an ayah. Actually, we'll just keep going. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُ الْكُفْرَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Just two more ayat left. Those who have exchanged their faith for disbelief. People who under pressure, they say, I don't want to hold on to my Islam anymore. It's too hard. There's too much pressure on us. I don't want to pray anymore. I don't want to look Muslim anymore. I don't want to obey Allah anymore. Because Islam is just in way too much trouble. I don't want to stick out like this. I just want to blend in. I want to be normal like everybody else. Like everybody else is normal. <laughs> Allah says those people who sell their faith. What about them? They're not harming Allah either. Meaning they've joined the enemy side. They can, you can't rely on those people. The people who were Muslim when times were good. And they, they run away from the deen when times are tough. Don't become from those people. You will lose the ultimate resource. You'll, le you'll lose Allah on your side. You might think you gained some support of people. But you'll have lost everything else. I met a guy. I, I met a guy who uh, I was talking to him. You know, I met him at a, at a mall. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. We're just, just got to know each other, and I see a crucifix. And I'm like, you said wa alaikum salam. Yeah, yeah, I converted. You converted really to Christianity? Well, I didn't really convert, but they were offering political asylum, and I had immigration problems. So I went to the church and I converted and I go there, you know, and I married one of them too. And, but I'm really kind of, I'm still Muslim. Wow. These people won't be able to harm Allah in any way. They play with deen, they have painful punishment. This is the last ayah I want to share with you. All of these about ourselves. Don't you ever dare imagine or assume that the extension that we have given to those who disbelieve, the resources we keep extending for them, giving them more and more and more, is good for them. Don't you ever think that the billions they have is good for them. Don't you ever think the resources, the propaganda machinery they have is good for them. Don't you ever think that. Don't you ever complain about that. Don't you ever think it. إِنَّمَا نُمْلِي لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِثْمًا we only give them more and more, we extend their resources so they can increase the, the sin on themselves. So they can take more responsibility on Judgment Day for themselves. You see, when, Allah, when someone does good, understand this formula, when someone does good deeds, Allah gives them the strength to do more good deeds. And then he, when they do more good deeds, He gives them more strength and more capability and they can do even more good deeds. He opens up more opportunities for them. When someone does bad deeds, Allah says, that's the door you want to go on? Okay, I'll open the next door for you. Go ahead, go through the second door too. When they go through the second door and do more sins, Allah opens a third door and says, your choice, if you want to go deeper, go ahead. And so when people do evil, then Allah lets the doors open for them, and they make the keep, keep making the choice and keeping, keep going themselves, digging themselves deeper and deeper and deeper. ظُلُمَاتٌ بَعْضُهَا فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ they keep get, digging their hole deeper. And Allah does not push them in. He simply opens the door. This is where you want her to go, right? He doesn't stop people from going in the direction they want to go. He doesn't force them, but He doesn't stop them either. So Allah says, I keep extending. 
I keep opening up more opportunities for them to do evil. Let's see if they do it, and they do it. We only do this so they can dig their hole deeper. They can increase their own, their own selves in sin. And at the end of it all, such powerful words, they are going to have humiliating punishment. All the efforts they made were to try to humiliate Muslims. And it's only fitting that the, that the response to that crime should be that they should have humiliating punishment. All the non-Muslims are outside are not the enemy. The vast majority of them are good people. The vast majority of them don't know any better. Your neighbor doesn't know any better. If you were non-Muslim and you watched the news, you'd be terrified of yourself too. You'd be, you'd be horrified. It's not their fault. They're victims of, of this kind of propaganda. The only response to that propaganda actually is you. It's me. How we are with these people, how we treat them. Not because we want good PR, because Allah wants us to be khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. We're supposed to be the best of all people brought out for humanity. You know what this ummah was supposed to be? When the Muslims live in India, every Hindu should swear that nobody treats them better than the Muslims. خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ When the Muslim lives here in a, in a Christian neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood, or some other non-Muslim neighborhood, everybody in the building knows, everybody in the complex knows, that if you need help, the one person who can help you, if you need, if you need to rely on someone, the one you can rely on is the Muslim in the neighborhood. He takes care of other people. Everybody here is individualistic. I just need to get my job, pay my check, you know, pay my bills, take care of my car, my, 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 my. And the Muslim says, hey, let me help you with your groceries. Hey, let me do this. Let me do... And they're constantly looking out for others. This is what we're supposed to be. Not because times are bad and it's good PR. That's what we were supposed to be all along. This is what we were supposed to be all along. And it's cheap and it's ingenuine when we only think about being that way when we're in trouble. This is what this ummah's job is. And we, when we come back to our job, no harm will come to us. There won't be any harm coming our way. May Allah Azza wa protect the Muslims, protect our families. I've, done, I've, uh, I've asked the masjid to print this for you. Um, there are a few du'as of the Prophet wasallam that he used to make when he left the house and, and when he traveled for protection for himself and the family. And I think this is a time where our, our reliance on Allah should be increased. So after the Jumu'ah prayer, I'm, we're going to pass all of these out. So please take one with you and have your family recite this with you. And keep it on the fridge or something, make a copy, put it in the car. Recite this stuff when you go out. If the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's an evil surrounding us and this is a time to get closer to Allah. And one of the best ways to get closer to Allah is to make du'a. So I printed this for you, I translated this for you too, so that you can inshallah ta'ala benefit from it. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa, khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin, Muhammadin al-Ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yaqulu Allahu azza wa jal fi kitabihi al-Kareem, ba'da anakula a'udhu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim, inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahima fil alameen, inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad, كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا